And welcome back to Breast Practices here on Facebook Live, where each week we have the chance to speak with my guest experts about best practices for guiding the breast cancer treatment journey. Today, I'd like to start with a quote from our guest that really resonated with me and why we meet here with you every week. Dr. Beverly Zabaleta, a physician who became a patient when she was diagnosed with breast cancer, says, I think the most important message for people is that if you educate yourself, you can listen to yourself and you can find a mindset for yourself that will anchor you, help you get through your treatment and live with cancer the best way that you can. That's so true. I'm Fazla Seeker, the president and CEO of Molly Surgical. And I'd like to welcome our guest here today, Dr. Beverly Zavaleta. She is a board certified family physician and obtained her MD from Harvard Medical School. She currently practices as a hospitalist physician in Brownsville, Texas. In 2015, when she became a patient herself, she was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer and underwent a very difficult chemotherapy regimen that incapacitated her so much that she wasn't even able to cook or drive. That experience and as a longtime advocate for patient education as a doctor led her to turn her attention to filling the gap in chemotherapy focused patient education materials. In 2019, she published her book, Braving Chemo, about what to expect how to prepare and how to get through it. You can order the book on her website where you can also sign up to receive regular tips, a newsletter and a free chemo day packing list. Just go to beverlyzabaletamd.com or you can follow her on Twitter and Instagram at bzabaletamd. We'll have those details again for everyone below after the show as well. Welcome Dr. Zabaleta and thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you, it's really great to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. Dr. Zavaleta, as both a doctor and a patient having undergone some of the most difficult cancer treatment, you offer such a unique perspective on breast cancer. Can you tell us a little bit about when you were first diagnosed and how you processed the news of your diagnosis? Yes, I think everybody who has been through a serious illness, especially a cancer diagnosis, has that moment of hearing the news burned into them. It's one of those moments where time slows down. So I I vividly remember it. I was at an after school kids party. It was actually the last day of school and it was a, a pool party. Some of the kids were outside and my phone rang. It was my family doctor and uh, he's a, a, a good friend of ours. And I took the news on the phone and it was, it was like my heart stopped, time stopped. I walked through the house just to get a little bit of privacy. And uh, the host of the party, one of our good friends, she just, she knew something was off. She followed me through, stood a little bit away. And when I hung up the phone, she just came over and I kind of blurted out to her because I was so stunned. And I, I just looked at her and said, I have breast cancer. And she also, kind of froze, got a horrified look on her face. And she just said, I'm here. And she engulfed me in her arms. And um, I remember that being actually one of the best responses anybody could have. Um, just, just being there, just being supportive and not, you know, not trying to fix anything or making it overly complicated. Um, so that was the first moment right there. I think that's great feedback to hear because I think as a loved one, you, um, you want to help and just not quite knowing what to do. And sometimes there's that instinct to want to try to fix. You're not going to fix. The way to fix is just mm -hmm. to let people know you're there. So I, that was really insightful and uh, great to hear. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, as part of your um, treatment and, and journey, the you had a number of different types of biopsies and biopsies are a regular procedure during cancer treatment. Um, you've had several, several different kinds, as I mentioned. Um, and I'd like to ask you to tell us a little bit about the process and your experience as a patient and specifically with a type of biopsy that uses wire localization. What is it? Why was it needed in your case and how did it compare with other types of biopsies that you've had? So I have a, an interesting and somewhat unusual history because I had had benign breast disease since I was a teenager. I had something called fibroadenoma. And so my first biopsy was an excisional biopsy back in the 80s. And uh, we don't 
we can get into that more later if you want to. Um, and then fast forward after my children were born and I was done breastfeeding, I was uh, in my late thirties and I was continuing to have these lumps and bumps and abnormal areas. I was in a high risk screening group. So in my thirties, I, I was having mammograms and ultrasounds. So I was under the care of radio of radiologist and a breast surgeon. And part of those screenings showed some more areas that needed to be investigated. So it isn't, it is not always the case that everything that's found on imaging, and this is an important point, not everything needs to be biopsied. And um, actually in my twenties, a very wise surgeon at the time said, we're not gonna just take everything out. Otherwise, once you hit 50, you'll look like a roadmap. You'll be so full of scars. And I've, I remember that uh, as well. Thank goodness for him that he had restraint not to just cut me up every year. Um, so when I had this particular area that was suspicious, it, it was not a lump that could be reached by a needle by a regular needle biopsy. So to distinguish that from the wire localization, if a lump can be biopsied by a radiologist and a radiologist is a physician, I imagine many of your viewers are quite sophisticated and they understand a lot of this stuff already. But um, just to make that clear, a radiologist is an MD and they do tons and tons of biopsies using different types of imaging where they can look at the area, the mass or uh, other abnormality, and then use a needle to take several samples. But sometimes they can't reach it. So talking with the surgeon or the sometimes the oncologist or the gynecologist or the primary care doctor, whoever is ordering the biopsy, um, they say, well, you know, we, we really can't get to this. And so then in that case, a surgeon is involved and a surgical biopsy needs to be done. So that's what I needed to have for this particular area. So what that involved is the morning of surgery, going first to the radiologist, so to the imaging center, and I was already dressed up in my, um, you know, in, in the gown. So you're in your underwear, you're in those weird socks that have like the gummy things on the bottom and they cover you in a bunch of blankets that come out of the warmer. So you're kind of all wrapped up bundle. I was bundled across like the, that, uh, that tube that connects the, all the buildings together, take me to the radiology center. And then the radiologist found the area with the ultrasound numbed up the skin and then she put the wire and it's it's literally a wire uh, and it goes into the mass and then sticks out the skin. So it feels a little bit Frankenstein, um, but you're, it allows the surgeon to know exactly where the abnormality is. So then they put a bunch of dressing and tape on it to protect it. And then from there, I was taken to the surgical suite. So, um, you know, it does, it does feel a little bit weird because of all the different, you know, you're, you're being taken from place to place before you finally get to, to go to the surgical suite, but it really allows for exactly making sure that the surgeon gets exactly the right piece of tissue out. So, um, a little more rigmarole, but definitely a lot of peace of mind. And for the surgeon, um, it, it allows for that exactness. And then once that specimen is taken out, it goes with the wire. So what's delivered to the pathologist is that piece of tissue with the wire in place. And then they actually can take x-rays, they mammogram that tissue and then compare it to the mammogram you had before the biopsy. So, um, so for me, it provided some peace of mind that we knew we were getting exactly what we wanted to get out. Um, a little more rigmarole, but, um, but to be honest, I think, I think once you're already up in it and you're having a bunch of biopsies, the most important thing is to know that it's, you know, you're, it's getting done right. And, um, uh, so that if it is cancer that, you know, you can make sure that you're, you're getting the correct diagnosis and you can make a plan. 
Um, the irony, I think, is that that biopsy was not cancer. That ended up being completely benign. I had a couple different areas taken out that surgery, and that was that was benign. And then I ended up being diagnosed with cancer in a different area a few years later. Um, but uh, but overall, the the wire localization was was um, not that not that invasive overall. And um, I think if your surgeon recommends it, it shouldn't be something that you should be afraid of. And that was really helpful and a really clear explanation of the process and, and your experience with it. Thank you. Dr. Zavaleta, I'd like to turn now and talk a little bit about your book, Braving Chemo. It's basically a field guide to patients as they undergo chemo and a valuable guide for breast cancer patients, care teams, and their loved ones. What are some of the most common questions that you answer in your book? Yes, thank you for asking. This is um, something that I care deeply about. Obviously, I spent a lot of time and effort. So uh, the book is behind me, a copy here. Um, this, uh, I think a field guide is a good way to describe it. Um, the questions that I hear all the time in the different cancer support groups that I belong to, which is a place for patients to talk with each other and share information and tips. I think the most common question is what do you know, I have chemo starting next week, what do I need to bring? How do I get ready? So that prompted me to include a chapter about that in the book. And also on my website, I have a downloadable chemo packing list, because that's just such a common question. So uh, briefly, to prepare for chemo, it's things like bring a warm sweater, a pillow if you want to, something to do. And then I also recommend people bring some sort of candy or gum because of the bad taste that's so common when you start getting infusions through your port. That's a great tip. And those are the types of details and things that um, you don't know when, uh, what you're getting into. So that, that uh, care package that you just mentioned and just having it all there, that's uh, just a, a terrific offering that you're giving. Right. And care package is a good point as well, because frequently if you have your caregivers or family or friends and they want to help you and, and they want to do something and they say, well, what should I give somebody who's having chemo? So the chemo packing list, things off the packing list are good things to give to somebody when they're going to start chemo or they're having chemo. And again, that's terrific information for that loved one who wants to help so desperately, but is feeling helpless. Mm -hmm. uh, Correct. It's so amazing just this package that you put together of not only the information, the book, but then actually a physical care package. So through your experience, Dr. Zabaleta, and um, your book, as you mentioned, you've connected with many like-minded people and their personal stories. What do you find most patients are afraid of? I would say that one of the big fears that's talked about a lot is the hair loss, which doesn't happen with every type of chemo. So let me just put that out there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's something that a lot of people don't know. For example, for uh, colon cancer, colorectal cancer, many times the, uh, the chemotherapy regimen does not cause hair loss. But for say breast cancer, most of the time it does. So there's a lot of discussion about hair loss and, and mourning that because, um, for many people, men and women, your hair is part of your appearance and then it kind of marks you as a cancer patient. So there's that kind of crossing of the point of no return when your hair falls out that it emotionally kind of finally hits you. So that would have to be one of the biggest ones. Um, are there others that are uh, also top concerns that the patients have? Uh, yeah, so the elephant in the room is, uh, am I dying? Am I dying right now? Am I gonna die during chemo because I'm gonna get some horrible side effect or is it not gonna work and I'm gonna die next week? Are my, you know, am I going to orphan my children? I mean, those type of, you know, hair loss is, is, is devastating on an emotional level, but I think on a more existential level, it's death, I mean, people, yeah, it, it, it hits you right in the face. It's You can't hide and you cannot hide from it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now you have a blog on your website uh, for both patients and their loved ones on getting through chemo. 
what are some of the topics that you've discussed recently and what are some of your top tips that can help patients who are undergoing chemotherapy? Yeah, so I started the blog after I wrote the book. Um, and so some of the topics overlap, but a lot of a lot of them don't. I kind of use that to um, write about things that I'm, I'm thinking about, sometimes current events. I wrote recently about scan, scanxiety, uh, which is the anxiety that cancer patients feel when they have to have tests and scans. So it's scan plus anxiety. Yeah. And uh, I had to have some testing and scans done in September. And so I wrote about having the anxiety related to that, which is, it's basically universal. In other words, you can if you're if you're in remission, if you're no evidence of disease, you are able to, for the most part, go about your life um, as a, a person with cancer. Um, and to some extent, I don't want to say forget about it because you're always living with some of the issues. But when you have tests coming up, there's that undercurrent of anxiety and worry that comes up about is the cancer coming back? What are these symptoms? I'm going to go have these tests done. And so I, I wrote about that. Um, I also wrote about um, how to re reclaim your sex life after cancer and cancer treatment. And that's a big one. There's been a lot of discussion about that in the forums and groups because it's just so devastating to have your body ravaged by all the treatments and um, whether your treatment was extremely difficult or or less difficult, it, it does change you. And so everybody has to get reacquainted with themselves and then with their partner, or if they don't have a partner, you know, hitting the dating scene again after you've been through something like that is is tricky. So that was another topic that I recently wrote about. And what are some of uh, your top tips and advice on that topic? Because I think that that is a really important topic that doesn't get talked about openly very often. Yeah. So I would say that my biggest recommendation is to, number one, be patient. Uh, try to not have huge expectations for yourself initially. Um, give yourself a little bit of forgiveness. Um, be patient with yourself and your partner. Ask for help. In other words, there are really good counseling resources available, especially now with telemedicine. So even people who live in small towns, rural areas can seek out cancer counselors who can deal with some of these sexual side effects. Um, so, so that's something I really encourage. And also to be creative and flexible and try to focus on things like intimacy and building your relationships with your intimate partner because it's not just about, it, it really can't just be about going out and having sex because you can't go from zero to 60. And I, I'm not a sex counselor. I'm so uh, this is, this is definitely a summary and, and there could be an entire podcast, an entire video chat on this, but um, focusing on intimacy so that you can build things back little by little and then see where that takes you and be willing to be creative and explore maybe new, new areas that you didn't, um, that you didn't have before new ways to connect with your partner. So, so I think that that is a way through this because there's so much that is lost or destroyed, especially, um, you know, if you, if you had pelvic radiation, um, I, I know that this is a breast cancer chat, but you know, for men and women, if they've had pelvic radiation, you can have nerve dysfunction for breast cancer patients. If they've had reconstruction, they don't have as much sensation. So mm -hmm. they have, so then you have to figure out a way to, uh, to enjoy things without the same sensation you used to have. So it takes, again, patience, creativity, asking for help, um, and trying to rebuild intimacy. Are there some um, good resources that you found that uh, you could share with our viewers? And I'd love to post them after the show so that everybody can benefit. Yes, yeah, so I, I do have a list. And I think for breast cancer patients, so, so the American Cancer Society 
is a great resource, but I but it is very general uh, and, and has different sections for the different cancer types. I also want to mention the website for ASCO, which is the American Society of Clinical Oncologists, and their website is cancer.net, and that is a fantastic resource for patients. For breast cancer specifically, um, breastcancer.org is wonderful. I also like some of the other more specific breast cancer organizations like the like Tiger Lily, the Triple Negative Breast Cancer Foundation. Um, young Survivors Coalition is also wonderful. That focuses on young women with breast cancer, younger than 40, and they have really great resources on employment and working and disability, which I think, um, again, if you're older, if you're already retired, then that's not as much of an issue. But for women in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, the issue of working is really important. So Young Young Survivors Coalition has a lot of information on that. And then I think I sent you a list with a few more that I can't remember offhand that you could also post as resources. Yeah, I'd love to post those after the show so everybody can see. Yeah. And if there's a particular blog where you talked about some of uh, um, the areas in terms of being able to find creative ways to reconnect with your partner, I'd love to just post that specific blog so people can go straight to it. Yeah, so that that blog is on my website. Um, I don't remember offhand if I listed the resources there, but I can certainly, uh, we can certainly add that. Yeah, yeah, we can uh, put that together. So mm -hmm. I'd like to move on now and talk about um, how in one of your blogs, you give the top 10 questions that patients should ask their oncologist. And can you talk to us about these and especially why it's so important not only to ask these questions, but also keep a written record? This is a great topic. I, again, my, my passion is patient education. And so that starts with good communication with your doctor, any doctor, but with cancer, it is even more important because there's a feeling of your life being on the line, which sometimes it in fact is. Mm -hmm. So if you can uh, write things down when you are in your visits with your oncologist, that will help you save the information for later so that you can reread it. And also if you're gonna do any research, you have those as notes and you can also share it with your caregivers, whether that's your spouse, family, uh, whoever is gonna be helping you with your cancer experience. So it's important just because you are so overwhelmed. I mean, even me as a physician, I think I spent the first three weeks in a state of somewhere between shock and autopilot. Um, you know, you're walking around as if you feel like you've woken up inside some sort of movie, like some horror movie, um, that, that kind of disconnected sense of unreality. So taking notes and writing things down, it just, it just helps anchor you. And, uh, you know, because when you're in that state of shock, you can't remember anything or, or not anything, but you just can't remember things as well as you need to. So, um, you can take the notes, your helper, your caregiver, your family member can take the notes, but somebody can take the notes. So I have to thank you, Dr. Zabaleta, for being just so honest about that, that as a doctor, even, um, it was overwhelming for you. And it's just that uh -huh. shock that uh, a person naturally goes into. So uh, I think that that is probably one of the most, you know, um, it, great things that you are giving to our viewers here, that even as a doctor, it's overwhelming. And so don't be overwhelmed by the, all the information. And there's some tools to help you out here. And so can you also talk to us a little bit about those top 10 questions that you have in your blog? For sure. So one of the most, well, probably the most important question is to know exactly the full name of your type of cancer and subtype if there is one. So this is the foundational question because exactly what type of cancer you have, the type, subtype, and then if there are any genetic or molecular markers that you have, write all those down. Because what treatment you have 100% depends on that. 
So get that down first. The second thing is what stage is your cancer? And uh, for solid tumors, it's stage. For some cancers, it's grade, and we don't have to get into that. So for, for breast cancer, it will be stage. And um, again, the, the treatment also will hinge upon that. So get that all written down. And then another important question is to get a sense of what is the plan that your oncologist and surgeon or you know the team, some cancer centers have a tumor board where they meet with all the specialty uh, physicians together. So what is the plan that they're proposing? Another question is, are there different options? And can they lay those out for you? And then based on the different options, are there are there different side effects of those different options? And, and this is really difficult, I think, for uh, a, a lay person, a non-medical person, because the complexity of the information can be quite high, but the team, meaning the physicians, the nurses, the assistants, the nurse navigators, that is their job to explain it to you in a way that you can understand. Um, because if there are choices for you to make about different treatments, what's important to you is that you understand the pros and cons of these different options, if you have them, and why one or the other might be better for you in your situation, your, how old you are, what's important to you um, for, your, for your situation. Um, I love how I I care you say, Dr. Zavaleta, you put the emphasis back on you, meaning you, the patient. And that is so true. Oftentimes there may be an experience where the patient isn't feeling like they're really getting that information from their care team uh, in a way that's useful to them. In that instance, what kind of advice do you have if you know the connection just doesn't seem to be there? Oh, this is this is a this is difficult and so important. Um, I was actually trying to help a family member with this over the last few weeks where there was a bit of a disconnect, even though and I'm not there. This is somebody who lives in another state. Um, and then with COVID, forget it. It's there's the communication has gotten so much more difficult with COVID because the family members can't go to the visit and we're trying to do things over the phone and you're you're on a, a Zoom call with the doctor and it's it's, it's a challenge. So um, it, if you feel as a, if you the patient feel frustrated because you're either not understanding what the options are or I think sometimes the, as a patient, you might feel that the doctor or the care team says, well, you got option A, option B, and then you say, well, I don't know, how am I supposed to choose? You're what? the doctor, just, just tell me what's, you know, what's better. And I think then th the challenge is, again, I believe it is our job, the healthcare professional's job, the team's job to try, to, really to try to parse it out so that we can understand, we have to try to get to the bottom of what do you, the patient value. So I think, let me give an example. Um, if I have a patient who is maybe a, a senior and is in their 80s and a particular treatment might be very aggressive and harsh and add a little bit of, of time, okay, might make them live longer, but I think they're gonna have a really rough time with the side effects and maybe has a higher risk right. of of putting them in the hospital with dehydration and a mm -hmm. high risk of infection. And and the, and I so then what I want to get at is okay, so you're 83, you're in pretty good, you're in pretty good shape, but they say, well, but I have, you know, so-and-so's wedding that I really want to go to in three months. You know, I might say, well, why don't, why don't we try a different treatment? If they're, again, assuming that there, there are options, because the goal is let's, let's get you to that wedding, you know, keep you healthy enough, 
do a different treatment, get you to the wedding and then reassess. So it's, it is, it's a blend of, of, of what are the, what are, what is the overarching goal? Okay. Um, versus maybe a younger patient who doesn't have any other diseases, you know, no heart disease, no diabetes. And if their cancer is very aggressive, they're going to want to choose the most aggressive possible. And even if there are more side effects, the, the, the goal is you want to try to go for a hundred percent cure with the most aggressive treatment you have. And if they get an infection, we'll just put them in the ICU and treat the infection. I mean, there's just a, a different goal involved. And so it's that type of weighing and, and you know, it's, it's, it's not a perfect science. It's um, because random things happen which I think everybody instinctively understands that. I mean, every human being understands that random things happen. And so you, you lay it out, you think about it. And then at some point you, again, as a patient, family, doctor, the whole team, you have to say, all right, well, to the best of our ability, this is the plan we're going to go with. So I think it's really important for patients to understand that that conversation about their values really being so core, to discussing with their care team and mm -hmm. that to feel like their care team is also asking them uh, mm -hmm. to making an effort to understand their values. I don't know the patients necessarily know that right in the very beginning. And I, I'm such a big fan of reinforcing that because that is so core to the entire patient experience, I believe. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think patients know that. And it's something that in, academic medicine circles. There's, I mean, there's a lot of research on it now. There's discussion of it. I, I definitely think in medical school training and residency training over the last 20 years, we have been uh, more trained to do that. I think that, um, I think it's a challenge to do that because there are so many barrier, barriers to good communication. Nobody feels like they have enough time with the patient. I mean, the patients don't feel like they get enough time with their doctors and nurses the doctors don't feel like they get enough time either. I mean, everybody feels like not, like there's not enough. And um, yeah, so, but, but we're striving. I mean, I, I believe that collectively everybody is striving to do better in this arena. So I, um, and I think that's, I mean, that's why I'm doing communication. I mean, that's, that is part, that is this project is to improve communication. So my goal with the book is to help give people tools to improve that communication so that they can do self-advocacy. And when they go in for their visits, they and their caregivers can, if you got seven minutes in that exam room, make, you know, make it count. Exactly. How can you get the most out of it? For sure. Mm -hmm. We're just coming up to the last few minutes. And what I would really like to um, uh, get to with you, Dr. Zavaleta, is how has the experience of being a patient yourself changed your perspective as a medical doctor? And what's your advice for other doctors who are advocating for and treating breast cancer patients? I'm really glad you asked me this question because I had I actually had a moment where this, where I realized something about this. And this was after my chemo had, had, had finished uh, for several months. It was between my first and second surgery. And I was doing some writing. I think I was writing, uh, beginning to write the book. And I was actually feeling really bad. I had terrible neuropathy. It was during the time when I I couldn't cook because I couldn't stand for very long periods of time. And so I was pretty miserable. And I realized that I had probably not really understood what people who live with chronic disease do on a daily basis. I think I, I I had thought that I did understand, but I realized that I really didn't truly understand. And I mean, I I think that I had offered compassion and and 
and maybe sympathy and I had been you know trying to help and and that sort of thing but I really didn't give people credit and uh, for, for the for the full time job that it is to live with chronic disease, and so I would say that my experience with having a very very difficult treatment, having extremely severe side effects, having to have a recovery from all that, and and now I live with a lot of uh, chronic issues because of this whole uh, experience and disease. It, it really really amplified and deepened that appreciation. So I would encourage physicians and anybody in healthcare to just pause if they're if they are taking care of people who have chronic diseases or serious illnesses to just take an just just pause an extra minute to try to appreciate how much work people are doing when they are caring for themselves and going through their daily life because it really can be a full-time job to do that. I think just to even acknowledge and encourage, well, acknowledge uh, that what patients are going through is a full-time job and to encourage them to make it their full-time job to take care of themselves. And as you keep saying, put the emphasis back on the you, the patient is probably one of the most um, important things that the physician can do. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much insight. There's such a wealth of insight, Dr. Zavaleta, and you are giving so much from your own time of taking care of yourself to help others. And so um, while I'm sure we could keep going on and uh, what I'm going to do, we're going to need to wrap up for today, but we are posting all of the valuable resources that you've developed. And, um, you know, perhaps we could even have you come back for it in a part two at some time in the future, because uh, I know that I've learned a lot just listening to you speak. And I think that this is so valuable for not only patients in our audience, their loved ones, but also the physicians and care teams um, to have that experience from both sides. So thank you so much again. That is all the time that we have for this episode today. Thank you so much for having me. It was my absolute pleasure. And Tune in next week, everyone, at our regular time on Tuesday for another episode of Breast Practices. And remember that you can sign up for notifications so that you'll never miss an episode. Thank you so much for joining us, and I'll see you next time.